Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O Culture, where drawing the hanged man brings a huge sigh of relief. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Happy New Year to each and every one of you if you celebrate such things. I did not do a damn thing on New Year's Eve except watch the new Star Wars flick, which was a bit too Disney for me, but that's really no surprise. Anyway, welcome to the show. Thanks for allowing me a moment of your time. We're starting 2018 with a sort of a B-side to how we ended 2017, and the featured player on this track is Sarah McAllister, friend of the show, and friend of mine actually. She's the proprietor of Spirit Cell Tarot, where she offers, you guessed it, tarot readings. We're going to talk a bit about tarot, a bit about Sarah's trip to the last Burning Man event, and a bit about fish. We also chatted the day after I recorded my chat with our guest in our last episode, Gil Bates, so his work was top of mind as well, and that's why I think of this one as a B-side of sorts. It's definitely not the lesser of the two tracks by any means in the traditional musical B-side sense. In fact, I think the rhythm and flow of this one gets us a lot closer to where we need to be in our personal journeys. At least that's how I felt, but I'll let you be the judge of that. Enjoy! Yeah, you know what? Okay, let's start there. First of all, Sarah McAllister, thanks for being here. Hello, thanks for having me. No problem. So, I don't know if I'll leave this part in, but you just said it's in your nature to challenge. That's also in my nature. I've found myself over the years challenging people in my life, especially those close to me, those that I love and those that I care about. Why is that? Why are we here to challenge people? Is is there something, are we of some sort of like extraterrestrial origin? Are we coming from the Pleiades or some shit like that? Let's get really new agey. Are we star seeds that are here to just spread love and light? Why are we here to challenge people? Because I feel like that is... Ugh. it's almost like too much like i just do it all the time and i do it without I do it without even thinking about it it just happens yeah that's a really loaded question honestly that's a big question to start out with but we'll just jump right into it i feel like you know the the archetype of a rebel uh is really prevalent the archetype of the rebel is always about kind of rebelling against what already exists to create something new so this is going out and this is like pushing to the fringes this is like going to the edge where novelty occurs and where um you know new ideas and then through those new ideas or new experiences and then new ideas that are formed from those experiences and then new structures and systems that can be put into place uh, based off of those experiences so i guess in the starseed sense it could be like coming here to like in a very simplistic way, change the world, you know, make dramatic change and dramatic change starts with an act of rebellion, usually. Yeah. Do you believe in the whole starseed thing? Do you find any relevance or credence to that? Does that strike a chord with you? You know, I believe in a lot of things. I'm really open minded. So I believe in it in a sense that it could be true, but I don't think that it absolutely is true. But I do. I know that a lot of us have resonance with being of another place and coming to earth or this world, which is, you know, still a part of, but also separate from that place. So I can see, I can definitely see, and we are scientifically proven to be made of star stuff. So I can see how people um, can embody and take on those ideas and those beliefs. Yeah. Let's get real personal here for a moment. So I remember a couple of years ago, when I first started really reading about you know, these occult and esoteric subjects, and I was on some weird-looking blog, you know, like a <laughs> it looked like a GeoCities blog from like 1996. Like it was just really, just really, really it was not designed well. But I was reading through a post on there, and I don't know why. I don't know how I even came across it, but I was talking about like star seeds and shit like that, and it had like a list of uh, characteristics. Of like, if if you exhibit these characteristics, then you're like, uh, I forget, like a star child or something. I forget how they worded it exactly. But, you can go uh, say what? I, I couldn't hear you. you can, like an indigo child. Yes, Thank yes. Yeah. Like, so, yeah. You're an indigo child here to help humanity and spread love and light. If you exhibit these, I think it was like six or seven characteristics. And I was reading through there and I was like, oh my God, like I'm, I'm every single one of these things. And I was sitting at work actually at my day job. And I kid you not, I, I started like getting real like emotional. My eyes started watering and I was like, oh man, like th- this changed my life. Like I'm a star child here to, here to <laughs> spread all this. And- <laughs> 
And then I look back on that. It's just just like maybe two or two and a half years ago. And I'm like, God, how how stupid was I to to get emotional in that moment? But I think there is something to it. Something, mm, you know, I, I don't know if I came here from, you know, like we said, some Zeta Reticuli bullshit. But yeah, th- I think there is something to that idea that we are here to spread love. I mean, I can get down with that. What's wrong with that? Yeah. That's the, if love and, and light and peace and all these things, if, if those are new age concepts that were meant to like, kind of shun because they get associated with the new age movement like well that's fine with me like i'd rather spread love than you know whatever it's hard to shun love when we know ultimately that the mysterious or that the universe is mysterious but we all experience love on a variety of levels so it's really hard to like put that in a that probably isn't a thing because it's like pretty much definitely the most widespread thing from my point of view from my vantage point as far as like universal experience And just the fact that we are, you know, to me, like the fact that we are, you know, we're miracles to be able to be here in general, even from a biological and evolutionary standpoint. And there's something about like the creative force of life that resonates like a tone of love to me. I totally agree with you. You said that we all experience love on different levels. I assume that also means we experience it in, in different ways. Have you ever experienced what you might call true love? And is this too personal or? No, no, not at all. I mean, for me, the true love of my life, I guess, in a in a sense, has been to come to know myself. And also, I I see love in the spaces where we are very broken and almost like at the bottom, but then, you know, something that we can't even articulate lifts us or moves us to a higher ground. You know, it's like an experience of uh, faith and grace, really. Um, I had an experience not even a year ago where I was really up in my head trying to hold all of this these different realities that are potentials for realities. And I was feeling very alienated from people because I felt that people were just very comfortable in their individual realities. And I felt like I was trying to hold all of these. And I just felt like, you know, I'm, I'm an outsider. I, I don't belong. And, and I was honestly feeling a very deep um, momentary depression to the point where I was like, what is the point in going on when I'm always going to have to balance all of these things? And something came to me. I don't know what I'm, I don't know what it was, but it, it spoke to me almost as if it was in a dream. It was like I was having a psychedelic trip, but I was sober and it opened my heart. And like, I really felt like it cracked my heart open and showed me like you are, are only different because you're making yourself different. You're setting yourself aside. I I suddenly could feel just like compassion and connection with everybody around me and that every individual soul reflected the same complexity and beauty and struggle and triumph that, that I, that I experience, but just experience in different ways. And, you know, it's one thing to know that on an, on a knowledge level, on an intellectual level. And it's a whole other thing to just experience in your, in your heart and in your body and in your soul, like an actual experience of that. And I think that comes from a place of love because you can't see it. You can't touch it. You can't even explain it. It's not something you can know. It's just something that you experience. So maybe experience in itself is love, you know, direct experience in itself could be love. Yeah, I think you're onto something there. I just had a conversation uh, yesterday, actually, with another guest that wrote a book called Love and the Three Levels of Consciousness. And he looks at love from um, a standpoint of it's sort of like imprinted at the at a base level of consciousness that exists in the brainstem. And that the brainstem is what stores all of the sensations and experiences from your life, especially, you know, if you have early childhood experiences that are traumatic, for example, then that severely inhibits your ability to love, you know, as you get older, because you've, you have that trauma. I think we use an example of, it's like the basement of a house. And if you have a bunch of uh, shit boxes, you know, hoarded down in your basement it's it's just going to clutter up everything and it's only until you like address that those traumatic experiences and that pain that you've had 
you know, and it could be from a variety of different reasons. Most of it, you know, stems back to your childhood and your relationship with your parents, for example. So what you're saying and what he said, I guess it's my point, is <laughs> you're two different people from two different backgrounds, but you're saying the exact same thing about love. And he took a little bit more of a of a scientific approach, but here you are just talking from, you know, feeling and sensation. And it's, it's the same it's the same explanation, and it'll pair well, I guess, in back-to-back conversations here. So that's really cool. Uh, I guess I guess before we talk any further, we should probably tell people who exactly you are and <laughs> why you're here. So, Sarah, uh, yeah, Sarah McAllister, please do tell people a little bit about yourself. I guess your claim to fame so far is you have your own tarot reading business, uh, which is pretty cool. We will definitely talk about that. But tell us a little bit about, I guess, when you first discovered this magical world that we live in. Well... Hi, yes, I'm Sarah, and I'm a tarot reader, and uh, I have always had a proclivity towards the numinous or the unknown or, or dreams, and I've always been very creative and like to use my imagination, but it kind of got snuffed out of me for a few socially and uh, psychologically conditioned ways, and I... I used to suffer from severe depression probably since I was 14 when I started to have that hormonal shift. And I really, I went through a, a deep period of atheism when I was in my early 20s, you know, just believing in nothingness and that kind of like nihilistic viewpoint. And it made me a very, very sad person and even more sad person than I was already prone to. <laughs> and then I started losing people close to me. I lost a couple of people very, very close to me um, within within a couple of years. So then I started searching and that like kind of put me on the hunt for there's just got to be, there has to be more because I have so many questions about how I'm supposed to deal with this like death thing. You know, it really started about just being faced with death and I was searching a little bit here and there. And then um, I entered into a relationship that was very dependent, still depressed. I was using substances that I should have been, shouldn't have been getting involved with for a little while. And then coming out of that, I started to experience an even darker, like dark night of the soul. So I guess like I came here through a series of like being knocked down and knocked down and knocked down into this place of like the unknown and learning to be, I found tarot as a way to learn myself more because I felt like I didn't know myself. I had a certain view of the world. And I, it wasn't like these things, like it, life wasn't working for me at all. I just was, it was, I couldn't deal with it. So tarot was how I started to deal with it in a combination with reading other spiritual texts and, and absorbing other uh, philosophies and also experimenting with psychedelics. I have been uh, able to pull myself essentially out of being a depressed person. And I have become a completely different person like a butterfly transforming a, a completely different person than I used to be. Well, that sounds yeah. like that sounds like a little bit of personal alchemy, perhaps, you know, I mean, you sort of take that darkness and transmute it into this light that we're talking about, which goes back to what we were talking about love just a few moments ago, you know, just going to that basement of your subconscious and clearing out all those traumatic and painful experiences that you had when you were younger and then using that to better yourself. So that's really cool. I'm, I'm glad that you shared that with us. I feel like we're really bonded all of a sudden. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so tell me more about tarot. Tell me more about how you like actually were introduced to it, you know, where you came across it and why it, it spoke to you in the ways that it has. Well, I actually, I saw a picture on Instagram of one of the cards and I was so drawn to it. And I just said, I'm just going to get a deck. Like it was, I guess it was just impulsive, probably intuitive combination of that. And I bought my first deck probably about four to five years ago. It was The Wild Unknown by Kim Kranz, which is a very popular deck, and it has actually been kind of credited with helping to bring tarot back into the mainstream. And I started pulling a card a day and journaling, and then I would do simple spreads, and uh, I started to really connect emotionally with the cards I was I was pulling and seeing their resonance in the physical world around me, which, um, as you know, is synchronicity. And I started really picking up these synchronicities within combination with studying, just started to just create, you know, what I've created now. Does that make sense? Is that clear? Yeah, yeah. What card did you see on Instagram that, that drew you in? 
It was the Two of Pentacles, which is a butterfly, uh, which is one of my spirit animals. It was on a yellow backdrop and it was really vibrant. And I just, you know, I'd always been like with my mentality, I'd always been kind of drawn to darker things. And I just, I couldn't get on board with the light stuff because I didn't understand it. I didn't have a container for it. I didn't know what it was. And I was really drawn to this like beautiful, bright, shining card with yellow in the background and a butterfly on it. And I can't find it. Maybe I'll send you a picture of it. Sure. Well, I guess I could just search it on the internet. I mean, shit. I have the whole world at my fingertips. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really nice. So people were looking at the two of butterflies in this deck. And yeah, I can see how that would draw you in. It's got like the little infinity there on the body with the with the pentacles on. And the rainbow. Yeah, and it was on a yellow backdrop. So kind of like my hat. I know this is weird, but. Mm -hmm. So when you first started reading tarot, you started with that deck, right? And Mm -hmm. how many decks have you worked your way through then? Or is that the only one that's your go-to? I don't own very many decks, to be honest. I only have two, or I guess three official tarot decks, but this is my baby. And so this is what I, this one, we are really connected. And so this is what I use most of all. The other deck that I have is very different. It's called the Serpent Fire Tarot. The illustrations are much different and the vibe of it is just different. And the messages that come through can be different too. So, and then I have, I just recently got the, uh, a mini version of the Rider Waite, which is the traditional tarot deck that, that most people learn on. Yeah. I have mine sitting here right next to me, actually. Oh shit. You said something that I was going to ask about and then I got distracted by me pulling my deck out. <laughs> that sounds weird. Oh, by me, I'm by me, <laughs> by me. I was trying to pull your deck out, Ryan. <laughs> I, I, shit. <laughs> yeah. My bad. Um, <laughs> okay. Now I really lost my train of thought. <laughs> What were we you talking about? You asked oh, me about different decks. You said, I think that different decks have different messages. Is that what you said? Something like yes. that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I really want to get into is are all tarot decks, I mean, they're all essentially, aren't they communicating the same archetypes? Yes. So how are they're, the messages different? Well, they're communicating the same archetypes, but it's like different expressions of it. I guess it's just different, you know, a lot of it, since it is so symbol driven, a lot of it has to do with artistic interpretation and what you're actually looking at. So the, so however the artist portrays it, you're going to get a different feeling about it, right? So, Mm -hmm. so the feeling is different and therefore the intuition is a, is a little bit different depending, or probably a lot of it different depending on what artwork you're looking at. So is this like, it seems to me then uh, on some level, it's kind of like a, like a Rorschach test. Yes. Right. So you have this image and you see it and it gives you one message. I see it. It gives me a completely different message. Is that possible? Yes. That's, I think my problem with, I just uh, like to stick with the Rider weight, or I, I guess you could just apply it to any deck is that if you study that, you know what these cards are supposed to mean i mean there's been books written about the rider weight for example that just dig deep into the archetypal symbology of it all and i think that sort of may cloud certain people's minds when they're working with it like they have these ideas of what these things are supposed to mean and they approach them with that mindset instead of going in fresh and not knowing anything and having a completely different experience or interpretation of the cards would you agree or disagree with that yeah i completely agree i think sometimes it can be a hindrance if people are relying too much on the official in quotations interpretations of it or meaning of it because then you're not necessarily allowing the intuition of your of what's coming through through you or what's you know kind of bouncing off the other person you're not always taking those into account but it is obviously appropriate to have like we need to have these symbolic meanings to give it meaning. You know, we need to have the traditional meanings and it is important to learn it because then you can understand the overall feel of the card. But I I do think, and I recently just taught a tarot workshop that the connections come from the emotional bond and actually experiencing these things within ourselves and out in the world, which gives us our connection to certain cards, certain archetypes, certain decks. So how much of this could be dependent on... So if I read my own tarot and I'm coming through a phase of my life that's maybe a little bit more negative, am I going to see 
more of that in the reading as opposed to if I came into it with maybe a more positive mindset? Yeah. I mean, these things aren't like, I mean, the true, I feel like the true nature of reality, that's not really something true and either, but you know, there's always going to be variating factors and variating perspectives. And it's always going to be different. That's why like, it's going to be different if I sit down with my tarot deck right now or five minutes from now, you know, so so it's always a different way of looking at and viewing of viewing it. Well, and then I'm wondering too, on on the other side of that, I guess, no, this is probably the same sort of sentiment, but the same card obviously expresses different meanings, whether it's drawn right side up or upside down, right? Well, I don't pull reversals. I only do straight up. But yes, tarot readers do pull reverse cards. And it can either, depending on your interpretation or how you were taught, um, it can either be kind of like an opposing idea or it can be, you know, just a continuation of like more dramatized, deeper kind of into the card. There's really are so many different ways and there are really no rules when it comes to tarot, which I think is what keeps it so occult, to be honest, because it's not structured. Yeah. It's, it's always kind of shape shifting. It does seem like, though, like talking about the Rider Waite specifically, because that's the only deck I have experience with. But it did seem like when I was reading about it, when I first started using it, that the reversal was like the flip side of the upright. Like the upright was always, it seemed like more positive. And if you drew the reverse of it, that it was it was inherently negative because it was kind of like the light side was up and then the dark side was reversed with the archetype. So that's a situational thing based on the reader and the person being read, perhaps, right? Yeah, I think it's based on the reader. In that sense, I think it's based on the reader, what they what their interpretation is of it. So you just said that you just picked up the Rider Waite for the first time. That's interesting to me because that is usually the introductory deck into tarot for a lot of people. Do you feel like since you have experience with other decks that you maybe read the Rider Waite differently than somebody who picks it up for the first time as their first deck? Maybe. I feel like it gives me even more room for growth because whenever I'm stuck with a card or trying to delve into it, I do research the Rider Waite interpretation and I go I go into that and I do look at that and I do feel sometimes that I have a better understanding when I just look at the Rider Waite. Like I'm like, oh, I can understand that because I learned it on something else, different way. But the Rider way is more explicit, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely more just, this is the symbol for this and, and, and it's out there and this is what it is. And it's, there are some cards that are beautiful to me, but honestly, I don't really resonate with the artwork emotionally. So I think that it would have been harder for me to start on a Rider Waite tarot deck. I mean, I bought this deck because I bought my first tarot deck because it resonated with the art. And a lot of people do buy their decks that way. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I actually know how I got my my deck. It was actually a gift to my ex-girlfriend. And then when we broke up and she moved out, I was starting to write a novel and I was I wanted to use some of the archetypes from from the tarot or some of the cards. I was like, "Can I borrow that?" And then I never give it back to her. But it's fair. It's <laughs> no, it's fair. It's fair because she took my spoons. But anyways, <laughs> like the spoons that you hang on the wall. No, no, I'm talking about like practical like spoons practical from the spoons? from the drawer. Yeah, <laughs> they're like little IKEA spoons. But whatever. Anyways, That's so great. well, no, I had to go buy new spoons. It's the pettiness of a uh, breakup, right? It's like, yeah. you got to divide all your shit up. Like, this is mine. No, no, that's mine. No, the cat's mine. Okay, well, the spoons are mine. Whatever. Yeah. So and then you just respond to, like, what you were wronged. Like, it's like, no, you don't give a fuck about the spoons, but now it means something. The spoons are a symbol. <laughs> the spoons <laughs> become some sort of weird archetype of your entire relationship. So do you, <laughs> do you remember the first time that tarot actually gave you some sort of truth about your life like was it the very first time or did it take some time to get into it honestly I felt connected with it the second that I got it I think that was an intuitive thing like this is just going to be so big for your life Uh, I really cannot remember specifically the moment that I well I guess what I'm saying is so besides being drawn to the art there wasn't an experience with it whether it was you reading it for yourself or somebody reading it to you where it just clicked and you were like yes there's something to this 
I think that probably after starting, just starting to learn it, I, I, I immediately started seeing things in my world. I pulled, well, I guess I pulled the first card that I pulled. So I guess it's true. was the Empress card. It's number three. And it just immediately resonated in, in my heart for who I was. And there's, per, there's, it's like a pink and purple tree and a black backdrop with a moon in the sky. And uh, it's a white tree, actually, but the leaves are pink and purple. I have this connection with the color purple. It's really hard to put into words, but basically just like the synchronicities were just piling up for me in a sense that it gave me dir- direct, you know, very dir- direct meaning. And I just like, I just had an instant con- an instant connection with it. So Yeah, and your hair is purple now, right? It's blue, but I it oh. was purple at the time. Okay. Well, I'm colorblind, so it looks purple to me. But <laughs> anyways. <laughs> okay. So how much of the history of tarot do you know about? Have you studied it to that level? Or is it more just you have just a working relationship with it now and you don't really care about where it came from? I'm not really a history person when it comes to it. I care where it came from in the sense that I don't not care. And if I hear information about it, I'm interested in it. But I don't have like a very strong gravitational pull to like learning about the history of it because it just works so well for me in the present. And I study a lot of people that are presently reading and working with it in our in our day and age. And to me, that is a more important use of my energy than diving into the past about it. That's not against people that are into the past of it. It's just for me, that's what that's what that d- it doesn't interest me as much. No, I, I totally get it. And I mean, I think there is to some value in studying the history of these sorts of things. Like, you know, all I know about it is that it started in Europe and it was a, a, like a traditional card game. It wasn't wasn't used for like divination purposes until much later, like even like just in recent history, like until what, like the 18th century, maybe or 17th century. I'm not really sure. I think seven, I think 18th century. Right. Looking at things like this from a historical perspective can, I think, also cloud your perception of it and not necessarily get in the way of how you read it, but it does, I think, sort of take you out of the moment of it. But maybe that's just me. I remember when I first started using the Rider weight, I was uh, Snapchatting my card each day because I, I did like a one card reading each day first thing in the morning and I would snap it out and it was always like the most interacted with snaps that I had put out there I don't do it anymore because I don't use snapchat anymore but yeah I don't know why I brought that up but I thought that was pretty cool no that, that is cool I think it was cool to the point where I could start to see it I don't know if it see this is my problem with some of these things all right and we can we can argue about this if you want but so for example I wake up in the morning and I pull a card and I read about what it means because I, I hadn't memorized what they mean. I still don't know what they all mean just by memory. I know a few, but I'd pull a card and I would look up what it meant and then I would I would wonder if, well, did that then set the tone for my day mentally? Did I convince myself that, well, shit, like if it was a, if I pulled a reversal, which I was working with, and that was a negative thing, did that just ruin my entire day? Did I placebo that into my reality for the day? Or was it an act of, I don't know, just like, I think you know what I'm trying to get at, right? Like, did I convince myself that my reading for the day was going to be, how do I phrase this? Are you talking about in the instance of getting a reading that affects your day negatively? Or no, just both, both positive. Is it the inner reflecting on the outer or the outer reflecting on the inner? Is that what you're questioning? Yeah. It's yeah. the same. I mean, it's not, it's indistinguishable. Why? We want oh. it because it's the same thing. Like as above, so below type like, of thing? Yeah. As within, okay. so without. As above, so yeah. below. We really are, especially in our culture, we want to put everything in boxes and we want to compartmental, compartmentalize. Cannot say that word. Um, and we want to. I think it's you know, compartmentalize. But anyway. Compartmentalize. <laughs> Yeah. And we also want to create cause and effect. And, you know, we're kind of learning and even through metaphysical studies that time is pretty much happening at the same time. And we just experience it in in that sense. And so to me, it doesn't matter whether it's like outside in or inside out, because it is the same thing. I just try and put it in a in a way of using using the tarot to guide and help. So if I pull Let's say even, okay, let's say I pull a negative card and it fucks up my day. It's still trying to teach me something. Maybe it's trying to teach me that a tarot card shouldn't fuck up my day. (laughs) Maybe, you know. That's perfect, yeah. (laughs) It's like, or maybe it's trying to teach me like a lesson that I keep refusing. And that's like my shadow. It's still in the dark. That's why it's dark. It's negative. We don't like it, but it's trying to reveal it. It's trying to show it. So if it, 
if it is reflected in our outside world, then it's even more saying like, Hey, look at me, look at me. I'm here. Like check this thing out. So that's my answer for that. How many times though has a tarot card fucked up your day? Like gotten into my head and been like, yeah, I don't know a few times. It was more when I first started working with it and I was resistant to the cards that I, I interpreted as negative and I didn't see that they were trying to teach me something. And I didn't see that it was like a multifaceted view of everything that everyone experiences. I felt like it was out to get me. And it was like, we're going to give you a bad card. Like, I felt like it was very personal and intentional. And I felt like it was rude. I was offended by it. Like, I was having all these ego, int- like, these ego pushed, my ego was pushing back on it. So I would, like, get pissed about it. But then I, <laughs> <laughs> but then I realized that, like, it, you know, it is something that is just a facet of what we experience. And it is the good with the bad. And you do have to take the good with the bad. And, you know, it's not fluffiness to say that bad cards try and teach us good things. That's truth. So in in the same way that a good card can have a negative side or something that we think we want that's good can turn out to be bad. Again, these are distinctions that our mind wants to create and that we really want to create, but it's really just all a part of the whole. And so when I pull a card like the nine of swords, which is like, you know, pretty dramatic or or the 10 of swords or, you know, a lot of the swords cards are hard to look at and deal with. Then now I just sit with it and I say, okay, this is an opportunity for me, for me to actually take into consideration that I might be looking at the world this way and, and that my thought patterns might be really, uh, destructive in this certain sense. And I'm going to take liberty and my choice as a human with individual will to change it. I hear what you're saying, but it is, it is very hard. It's, it's like you have to discipline yourself to not take your own experiences so personally. I think that's like, that's like one of the most difficult tasks that we could undertake here is learning that everything that happens to us is not always about us. It's not, <laughs> it's, it's not always about us personally in our own personal lives. It's very hard to, to get to that level of awareness or comprehension. But that's something that I, that I learned too, is that not everything that's happening to me in my life has anything to do with me. And I just need to let go of it and not give a fuck about most of this shit because it will fuck up my day. Yeah. I mean, it definitely takes it definitely takes a higher level of awareness. I mean, this is kind of why we meditate to be the observer. You know, it's helpful for people to adopt mentalities where like, we are a dreamer, but we're also in the dream. We're playing in in a movie. We're just, you know, or like having an experience on like a psychedelic where you realize that like you're basically just wearing a costume and when you die, you get to put on another costume, you know, and also having a sense of humor about life is really, really helpful when it comes to that. But I know for more, you know, for more serious types of people, you know, I can be a very serious person, but learning to have a sense of humor and embracing, embracing comedy and lightness about things has been able to take me out of the position of being so important. You know, it's really just your ego thinking that you're like the most important thing in the world when you're actually just like, you know, it's true because you are really fucking important, but you're also not important at all. So it's, you know, it's still that, that balance of snowflakeageness, I guess. Yeah, we're all beautiful, unique snowflakes, right? But everyone is a snowflake. But, yeah, everyone, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so at what point in your tarot journey did you realize that this is for me and I have to share this with the world? You know, And I'm talking more specifically now about why you wanted to create Spirit Cell, which is your tarot business. It started about uh, a little over a year ago when I got the message from On High that I should go with it and that I should start doing it professionally does that mean that you got it while you were high or does that mean that you got it from another source that you (laughs) was higher than you i look at it as like higher source or like my higher self or spirit but i do like to get high from time to time so it could have been that too no it wasn't that it was from (laughs) from my higher self i'll call it from my spirit guides i was like okay here i'm gonna go i'm gonna go with this i'm gonna move with it and it's just continued to unravel as my calling, so to speak, and making me feel um, purposeful in this life. And uh, like I can use my skills that were always kind of outcasted from society, you know, being a deep person, being interested in alternative ideas, 
what, whatever I felt made me feel alone and alien, I'm, I'm integrating it into a way where I can actually help other people around me and be in service to the rest of humanity. And that is the most like liberating thing that I've, that I can do for my life and for myself. So how do you deal with people who are skeptical of tarot or wary of it or just outright don't believe in it or doubt it and don't take it seriously at all? How do you approach people like that who come into your life, family or friends even? Like, how do you, how do you explain it to them? How do you try to justify it to them, et cetera? I don't really try and justify myself anymore because it just takes up a lot of energy and I and I'm not about convincing a person to think or believe another way that they already do only because in that sense, only because I just don't, I don't know. Like I'm thinking of my family specifically, like my mom's really interested in it. So I can explain it to her. Like I'm just talking to myself or, you know, like I can, I can explain it to her with like all the passion, but I'm really good at sensing like how far I can go with a person. Usually like my dad isn't interested in it at all. So I don't try and like, I don't try and really explain it to him because he doesn't care. Let's do some role play. So you're at a bar and I don't know if you travel with your cards to the bar, but let's just say in this situation (laughs) you have and you and your girls are sitting around a table and you're just casually shuffling through the deck and a really nice handsome man comes up and he's chit chat and he, he takes notice of your cards and he's like, what are those? And you're like, oh, they're tarot cards. And he's like, what the fuck? How do you explain to somebody like that who's very skeptical, maybe even on some level fearful of them because they are a bit mysterious? I don't really address the skepticism, to be honest. I'm like, well, if it, you know, it's not for you, it's not for you. But I do address the fear because that implies that somebody is like somewhat interested, but just doesn't. I guess I could get into that, but. If somebody is fearful, which a lot of people are, I usually try and explain to them that like, I'm not a fortune teller, like I'm not going to tell you how your life is going to unravel like it appears in the movies. These are archetypes that already exist within you, whether you're afraid of them or not. And we're just going to bring it out into the open. And I think a lot of people are somewhat um, afraid of that actual fact of bringing themselves out into the open, which is totally understandable because it's vulnerable. But I also a lot of people like almost every single time I'm reading somebody's like, well, I don't want to get the death card. And I'm like, well, it's not literal. I mean, I guess it can be in some readings, but it's typically not. And second of all, it's only halfway through the experience of the of the major arcana in the tarot. It doesn't signify the end. It only signifies a deep change. So there's not really anything to be afraid of mm-hmm. when it comes to that, you know? Oh, I yeah, I'm I'm not afraid of death on any level, whether it's metaphorical or literal. I haven't really talked to a lot of people in my own life about this, but I do remember one conversation with a friend of mine who equated it to calling Miss Cleo on the psychic helpline or going to a quote unquote fortune teller, getting your palm read, things like that. How do you address those sorts of comparisons? Because it's really not the same at all. It's not fortune telling, right? It's, it's, It's divination, but how do you explain to a layman what the difference is? I usually explain it as that we we all carry these archetypes in our in ourselves and in our subconscious and it's just a way of, of looking at the stories that we're telling ourselves and in the way that I use it to giving people another perspective on how they can possibly look at what they're facing in their life and their outside world and their inner world and how they can make change or how they can embrace it or how they can extenuate it, you know, whatever is being called to discuss. I really use it as a transfer, a tool of transformation. You know, I don't want to demystify it most of the time because uh, I do think that there's a preciousness to be had and how it is mystical, but it's very practical in the way that I use it. And I tell people that, you know, I use it very practically and pragmatically. Let's transition just a little bit here. You mentioned psychedelics a couple times and I know you've, we're on a uh, psychedelic milk friend of the show, Ed Liu. Great dude. I listened to your chat with him back when you had it many, many months ago. So I don't want to repeat a lot of those questions and conversation, but uh, psychedelics is something that I don't have a lot of experience with personally. I had some 
experiences with them when I was much younger, like in college age, and not any recently. I, I usually just smoke a little weed here and there, and that's about it. That's not really, to me, psychedelic. But tell me a little bit about how experience with psychedelics has has changed your approach to something like tarot. I assume that it gives you that sort of window that maybe will justify the fact that there is something to these divination practices. You know, psychedelics are consciousness expanding. And so when you're able to see your life from a greater perspective, or when you're able to see the more wholesomeness, or when you're able, you know, it's again, talking about that idea of knowing something intellectually and feeling it or experiencing it when you dose with a psychedelic, or take it as a sacrament, or, you know, however you want to call it, or look at it, it is, it gives you an experience that you can feel in all layers of your body, um, as opposed to like reading a book, or, you know, there's, it's, it's very, it's more real, it's more visceral, and it allows you to really experience these, the, gr- the greater aspects of yourself in life. What do you have experience with then? You don't have to share uh, if you don't want to. I mean, just I was just curious. What... No, um, I've I've had some in my alternate reality in my other self. I've had some experiences with mushrooms, with LSD, and that's it. Well, those are two uh, pretty beneficial psychedelics. Actually, they're all beneficial. But yeah, I had a mushroom experience when I was. I guess it maybe 21 or 22, but I had a really terrible trip because my set and setting were like the worst set and setting that I could have been in at the time. I was a mess mentally. and I didn't know anything about set and setting back then, to be honest, but I was just going through like a really weird time in my life and then had a roommate who was a, a coke addict and we just had a lot of negative energy and, and personalities around and it just, it really scared me. Like what I was experiencing at the time, like really scared me and I... For a long time, I was like, that shit's, as we used to say, whack. And I did not <laughs> I did not want to experience it anymore. But obviously, I've learned more about it in the last few years of my life. And now I'm like, I need to find some mushrooms. But yeah, so how do... I want to... Go ahead. Or, I was going to say, so it's, it's also about like... So one time I was at a festival and I took some with my friends. And I had an experience where I felt like I was slingshotted through time. And I always have this experience in dreams and whenever I take psychedelics usually that I can remember being like a fish. Like I can remember the bio, like going all the way back to being at the biological, at the evolutionary level of being a fish. What that, that could just be me accessing that archetype, you know, from when going deep in and accessing, which it probably is. It gives me a sense of tying throughout time, like I am timeless, you know, like I'm of the past. It makes me feel really connected to earth so that I have that level of connection. And then the other experience that I had during this festival experience was that we are all like gods to be able to incarnate as humans. And this, keep in mind, this wasn't anything that I had read and like, taken in at a conscious level beforehand because there are a lot of like philosophies that say this this was and maybe I did read it and I didn't realize it or you know whatever but I had a feeling a visceral experience that every human that gets to be a human is like a god and that we all are just so powerful such powerful gods walking amongst the earth together in this incarnation So like I said, it's one thing to read that in a book. It's another thing to feel that experience and have that happen in your body because I'll take that with me for for the rest of my life. And that relates to how I treat people. I treat people better now. Yeah. I wish I had some experience like that to draw back on or to fall back on, but I have not had any sort of like deep, intense spiritual transformation. You know, like I believe in it. I feel like it's there, but I haven't been able to access it or experience it in the way that you just described. I will say, though, that when you were talking about the fish, it made me think of the uh, the story of Jesus, how the fish was the symbol of Jesus for a long time before it was the cross, even. I thought, well, man, like, that's interesting. Maybe that in itself is symbolic on a level of that's where we all start as a fish. And then we eventually rise up to that Christ level of consciousness 
Jesus, right? Jesus Christ, that sort of ascension process. So like the fish is like the most basic base level where you are at or where you were at in that experience of yours. And then that's why it was a symbol of, it's not necessarily then a symbol of Jesus, but it's sort of like a symbol of his beginnings. And then Jesus is us getting to that Christ level. Yeah, that's a bit, that's really profound, and that is actually, you know, the Christ. I think you're talking about this on your last podcast. The Christ, co- the Christ consciousness, and Jesus in general is a very like Piscean theme. Pisces being of the water, mm-hmm. Pisces being represented by two fish swimming in a circle, and Pisces being the element of being in the womb, having oneness, being in a cosmic blanket, being fantasies, dreams, visions, like this this place almost even like what happens before the big bang kind of a thing like mm-hmm. just this like all this one this allness and this nothingness at the same time but it's like you know freedom and surrender and so i think that also goes into play because i had this experience the same time where i i could not feel myself being separate from anything else like i close my eyes and i I had to open them again after a little while because I thought I was just going to completely dissolve. Like I could not feel boundaries between myself and other, and other things. And this is the, this is the Pisces state. That's water. That's where, that's our subconscious. That's where like, you know, everything kind of rises out of. And in the same way that the fish evolved to come out of the water and, and, you know, after many stages here we are now, I mean, is that not moving as fuck? Like, does that not (laughs) go to dreams? Like, well, okay, so let's take all these analogies that we were just using and let's sort of bridge them all together. So we have the Big Bang. We have God's, the religious story, uh, Let There Be Light. To me, those are the same thing. Those are the same event. You know, the Big Bang is the scientific equivalent of Let There Be Light. But now we bring in this component, which you were just talking about with Pisces and the fish and the water. What happens before you're born to your mother? Her water breaks. And then and you... A, it follows Pisces. Uh, sorry, Aquarius is before Pisces. I'm just learning all about this in my class. So I'm like really stoked on it. Aquarius happens before Pisces and Aquarius is the water bearer. Well, there we go. So you're born then, you come through the birth canal. Uh, canal is again a watery sort of word, right? Yeah. And then you come out of that and then bam, it's all this light. It's a new world. So we have just summarized thousands and thousands of years worth of religious texts and scientific discoveries in about five minutes <laughs> yeah <laughs> there, no more no more mysteries of the world people like right here <laughs> to see that's that's i think the key is that we get so fucking caught up and i've talked about this many times we get so fucking caught up with the external search for truth but everything everything you ever want to know it's already here. It's already right here with you. And the story of the universe is the story of your verse. Yes. One yes. verse, universe, right? So that's just like, <laughs> to me, it's so it's it's profound, but it's also very fucking simple and kind of disappointing. Just in, just in a way, right? It's like, wow, it's, it's, it's that simple. And we complicated all of this shit for so long. And it's really, it's not complex at all. It's just, it's, it's right here. And it goes back to love. It goes back to that journey that we were talking about at the very beginning of true love is discovering it within yourself. It comes back to too, like when God said, let there be light it's also automatically created dark so that's where the complexity comes in it's i don't know for me it's still very mysterious even though it's you know it's still it's still very mysterious and i think that you're right as far as that it does all come back to love absolutely man and that's what psychedelics i think opens you up to that really you know people that may not have experienced what we would call love prior to a psychedelic experience you know that opens your heart up to that that world of love within you and and then you you come out of that and you see everything differently and then there's experiences which i want to talk about like going to burning man for example where you you do this with other people you you get into this this really interesting space you know where you are surrounded by people who are having these experiences on their own and then you come together collectively and i never had that sort of experience obviously so i'm wondering you just went to burning man this year Uh, we were talking about that a couple of weeks ago and i I want you to tell us a little bit about it because i know there are people that listen to this that are probably interested in such an experience but what was burning man like did you feel the love while you were there did you open yourself up to it did you go in there with any sort of expectations of it was it your first time even 
It was my first time. I didn't have any expectations. Uh, I obviously wanted to have a good, well-rounded experience, and I did. I did have that. But one of the takeaways for me from going and having that experience was that I wasn't alone in what I, how I feel and what I'm experiencing and what I'm trying to enact in the world. I felt, I felt very connected with other people and other people that are on the fringes too, so to speak. You know, it's like a collective fringe or something that is becoming more and more powerful in the world and is really starting to, you know, Burning Man is an active way a physical representation of how things potentially could be. You know, it's a city that is built in a week and, or it's a city that's built and it exists for a week when everybody comes together to work and play and celebrate and grieve and all of these things that we experience in life. And it, it definitely opened my eyes to new potentials of ways that we can actually live. What do you mean by uh, that exactly? Could you elaborate on that? Well, you know, there's no money involved. Well, but it does it does cost money to go there. Quite a bit of money, money, actually. It costs money to go there. Yeah. But when you actually get there, there's no nothing happens on a monetary monetary basis other than buying ice and coffee. You can buy ice, which people need to buy while they're there. But even down to water, you need to bring your own water. So you need to bring everything with you that you need. And it's not even like a barter situation, it's a gifting situation. So people want to give you something, it's even that much more special to share with other people. And then it encourage it's a gifting community. So you're encouraged to give, I guess a lot of it is, you know, you have to work hard to get your everything set up, you know, to establish your space, your shelter. But then it's not like here where it's not here in this world, default reality, where you work really hard, and then you get to play. It's like you can work and you can play while you're working and you can, you know, you can drink your, you can drink your beers, whatever. And then you work really hard and then you're like, okay, we're going to go out and play. And it's the play element of it is what is most exciting and intriguing to me because it's like just an adult playground and nothing is so serious and nothing is like you can see anything that you can possibly imagine. It's like the absurd and the sacred all at the same time. So it's just, it's really free. It's really, really freeing in that sense. There are some criticisms of these sorts of festivals, though. And now I know Burning Man is different than like a, like a music festival, for example. But there are some criticisms out there of these sorts of gatherings, uh, mostly you know, that, that it, it seems rather cultish or cult-like. And if you venture into conspiracy theory territory, you know, that some of these are really just experiments to get a lot of people together and then experiment on them, whether it's psychologically or emotionally or whatever. Did you see any or feel any sort of anxiety or paranoia while you were there? I mean, isn't it, isn't life kind of like an experiment? Yeah, absolutely. I guess this is like, we were kind of talking about this a couple of weeks ago, but I don't believe the essence of it is so beautiful and sacred and freeing and people choose of, of their own volition to go to it. So it's like, why would there be, even if it was an experiment set up by the Burning Man organization or whatever, what's the problem with it? Like it's a good experiment if the results are beautiful in the sense that like, Oh, like I was saying, this is showing us alternative ways to live when the current ways that we're living are not necessarily working for us. I don't see anything wrong with it, even if that was the case. I guess the cult mentality, you know, it's a slip it's a slippery slope with belief and what and what people what ends they will go to given their their certain beliefs. But that's true on any level, whether it's an individual level or a cult level or a religious level. Well, there was that, we talked about this too, there there was a uh, an incident that this year, there was a man that ran into the fire of the Burning Man. They had found out after he, uh, well, he, he died in it, obviously, and, but they had found out afterwards that he was completely sober, which was interesting. Did we ever hear any more about that, actually? Well, I was just thinking about this after you and I were talking, but with the certain sense of mirroring and like outside in and like kind of coming into resonance on every level, I mean, it is quite crazy that a man actually burns at Burning Man to start with it, like that it happens in a literal sense. The theme this year was radical ritual, which, you know, a ritual is kind of creating, bringing down like the 
deeper into like physical realm or like, you know, create a situation where things can resonate and happen on those multiple levels, that kind of shit can just symbolically drive you wild. I mean, the fact that somebody actually like, like a ritual is just enacting something and he like literally physically ran into the fire and died. So that just is something to like kind of mull over. I personally don't think that somebody made him do it, but that's just my point of view. I don't know why he did it. He could have been like, I lived a fucking good life and I'm ready to go. They, I don't think they came back with the toxicology report if he had any like drugs in his system. I think they only came back with it at first for the alcohol. Well, that might have been what I was thinking of, yeah. But He could have been on psychedelics, which would make it more understandable because – I guess his family claimed that he didn't he didn't have depression or anything. But now that we're ta- kind of talking about it, you know, and I'm, and I'm kind of putting him into like a story sense, it makes me feel very sad for him as a person. And I feel kind of like maybe it's being exploited a little bit to like be talked about so much. It does sort of, you know, I could see how on some level it, it does look it does look itself like some sort of maybe occult ritual and, you know, get into like elite belief systems and things like that. And who may have put him up to it? But that's a whole other rabbit hole that we don't need to go down. But yeah, it is it is an interesting, you know, in all of the years, though, that this festival has been going on, nothing like this has ever happened. And it just happens to be this year with the radical ritual theme. So I just thought that was interesting. And you were there. You told me you, you didn't see it happen but you definitely heard about it. So did that dampen the mood at all? Well, I did want to talk about like what we were kind of, what we can go into this after what we were kind of saying about a viewpoint on conspiracies. I know you and I were talking about that, but it did affect the mood actually. And I didn't find out about it until later. I just kind of was like, well, maybe people are sad because it's like the last night, second to last night, but like last like official like celebration night. And like people, I just thought maybe people just feel that feeling after the man burns, you know, I didn't really know. But I mean, for me being an intuitive person and, you know, an empath of sorts, I could definitely pick up on vibes that were like, it, it did feel different, but I didn't find out about it till a few hours later. There's, there's like, it's everything happens in synchronicity, but it's like the importance that you put on it and the viewpoint that you put on it. So a lot of people see connections and they automatically see conspiracy. The universe works in a series of synchronicities. You know, a teacher that I have says the universe loves to rhyme. So just because things are like connected and they make sense and they seem they can be, that's how mysterious they are, doesn't mean that it's conspiratorial or it's plot oriented. And I think that there needs to be a level of discernment. I do believe in some conspiracy theories to a certain extent. I'm not saying that those, it cannot exist, but I do think that we have to have a level of discernment before we dive down the rabbit hole that everything happens that's synchronistic in life as a conspiracy, because that's just not true. I don't know. I'm, I'm really not trying to bash like conspiracy theorists at all. Like, I think it's all very fascinating. I just feel like you know, there's a certain way of looking at the world with like paranoia and mistrust that doesn't necessarily lead to the best way of life and um, looking at yourself and looking at your interactions with people. And I think when we're talking about like higher consciousness or enlightenment or just it's about trying to live like your best life. And so we have to be really discerning when we're adopting viewpoints about how those viewpoints affect ourselves and the people around us. And if they're healthy, if they're healthy viewpoints or if they're destructive viewpoints. That goes back to the beginning of our conversation. That sort of mindset, that paranoid mindset does lend itself to a a lack of love and compassion in your life, you know, that you may not have been shown that when you were a child. So you you grow up with this with this worldview that's been formed by traumatic experiences. So when you look out into the world, your subjective view of it is is rooted in that trauma. So you see nothing but pain and suffering and, and sorrow and negativity. Uh, and that's why it is so important to to dig into that and transmute it and and bring yourself back into a state of harmony. So, but I also think too, it's like there's like a collective disharmony going on. I don't know how we all got here together, but we really need to do something to to bring that balance back. Do you have any thought on that? Like, how as a collective we got so out of balance? There's so 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 many factors like to, that go into it, but one of them on I guess a more spiritual level is that this kind of view of the world or the permeating dogma that God is dead and the only things that we can see or the only things that are real are things that are 
visible things that we can measure, you know, kind of this materialistic reductionist worldview that puts us along with capitalism and consumerism, you know, all these factors tie in together and it puts us at a place that is very lonely, very isolated. We don't feel purpose. We don't feel meaning. We feel like everything is cold. Nothing is animated. It it just gives us a view of the world that is very stagnant and we cannot figure out our relation to it. And thus we cannot figure out who we are. And it just makes us, it, it just feeds depression, which feeds addiction. These are all things that are really re- relevant and prevalent in our times. And that's why adopting a more of a magical worldview or engaging in these elements of, of experience that maybe you haven't found someone else that mirrors for you yet in the society, but you will find them, you know, and we can find those people through the internet. I think the internet is really helping with being able to connect on that level. And then just, you know, becoming re-enchanted with the world and, and looking at, well, maybe there are things that exist that, that I can't see. And maybe my experience, my inward experience that I have with the numinous and the mysterious doesn't have to be reflected by other people all the time too. Maybe, you know, I can just accept it. And coming into a place where we can view ourselves as part of the natural world instead of being separate from it and looking down on it like we're higher and we're just observing it. It's like, no, we are a part of it. So now we start to work together. We start to conspire, if you will, together and live together and create. And so everything is moving and everything is changing, which gives us another set of things that we need to psychologically work through because we can't really hold on to anything. So it's always evolving, but a worldview where we are like for spirit cell, it's like being a cell in a body or like, you know, a body, like a superhuman, like we're little humans and like the superhuman kind of organism that just gives so much more meaning to life. I wish I could articulate it better because I have so many thoughts about it. Um, I'll probably write a book someday or something, but I, it's just like a, an individual power that we can hold on to knowing that again, we are something, but we're not everything. You know, it's like when we pass and we go and we leave our body, what is left behind is like how we affected people and how we contributed to the growth and the health and the actual safety of the world, not the safety that has been prescribed to us through decades of needing needing people to tell us what to do and who to be and to what structures we have in place and what things we can put in our body and who we can fuck and who we can marry and all those things. Like we don't need that anymore. Like we're, we never did. But we're just, you know, we're just advancing. Like, I really, I really do believe that we are advance, advancing, that this is, this is a necessary part of our evolution to go to this dark place of nothingness, just as I personally experienced to come to a higher place of knowing and a higher place of being and loving each other. Let me tell you what you just did. You <laughs> reached deep inside of me and activated <laughs> my feel spot so much that I don't really know how to follow that up. But I will say though, that we have collectively entered that darkness together. And the only way to come out of it is to go through it. So only out is through. That's what they say. Absolutely. Hey, let's end on a positive note. Let's do a very, very quick tarot session. How about, should I just a card? Just one card, flip one card and let's just, let's just talk about it and describe what you're doing. If you could. Oh, I am shuffling my cards right now. And is there a, uh, do you shuffle in a specific way with a specific hand placement or does it just whatever? I just do like a typical shuffle that you would find it, um, like the, the truffle shuffle. <laughs> I don't know what it's called. <laughs> the truffle like, shuffle. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's, I don't think that, I think that's a different kind of shuffle. <laughs> I'm going to call it that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just do the truffle shuffle a little bit. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and then I usually just cut the deck into, like, three or so. Now, if I was there in person with you, would I be able to cut the deck in a certain way if I wanted to? Would you allow that? Yes. So I, depending on your vibe, I would either, I would ask you to cut the deck, or I would lay all the cards out and ask you to pick the cards. Okay, so so based on the vibe that you're getting right now, which of those scenarios would you offer to me? 
Well, I already – I just picked one while we were talking. So I didn't huh. know you are going to ask me that. <laughs> All right. No, that's totally cool. <laughs> but probably because we're not in person, I would just pick one. Okay. You know? Yeah. I pulled number 12, The Hanged Man. Oh, buddy. Okay. So let, let's tell people what that means. So this is a slippery one. It's one of the most like confusing cards in the deck. In this interpretation, it's a bat, and he's hanging there. So I would say – this is the stage before letting go. So it's the element of what it takes to be ready to surrender. So an exercise could be to imagine what it would be like to lay down your defenses for a moment. You know, everything in you that wants to fight, everything in you that wants to resist, anything in you that wants to protect put it down for a second and see what's left. Well, based on what's transpiring currently in my life, I would say that that is a hundred percent spot on with what I'm going through right now. So maybe not the most positive of notes to end on, but I think ultimately it is a positive thing. Obviously. I mean, it's really, it seems like it's not, but then when you look at what's left, I mean, There's something beautiful that's there, right? There's something original, peaceful, maybe growing, gestating. It's going to be different for every person. And this is, these words are going to mean something different to every person that hears this, but just for like picture, you know, I picture my body, like I'm holding my, my fist really tensely and I'm like, you know, we're really stressed because we're like overstimulated all the time. So I'm like, like clenching my jaw or whatever. And I just like, instead of that feeling, like I just automatically let go. I release my actual grip from my wrist and I take a breath and I try and relax my jaw. And I imagine what it's everything that is I'm put up against, even like the way I'm talking right now is a little bit aggressive because I'm passionate, but it's like, what if I just talked really like truthful and softly and from this space of heart space you know that's just one example of what what we can do that reminds me too several months ago somebody said uh somebody said to me you talk very passive aggressively and i was like no passionately aggressively (laughs) there's a difference (laughs) there's a huge difference like i i do get in that same sort of mode where when I I catch myself talking what could be perceived as aggressive, but inside of me, I know that I have so much passion for what I'm speaking about that it comes off like I'm a dick sometimes, but I'm so passionate about it that I don't realize it and it feels good to me. It feels like right to talk like that about subjects or certain things. And I think to the to a person that's not used to that, not not used to dealing or experiencing passion to that level, it, it does come off very aggressive. But to me, like, oh, I, it's, I love to hear people in that space, get into that space where they can talk like that because it's so raw and it's so real and it's so honest and it's so true that why would you ever want to shut that down? You know, why don't you shut that, shut that side of you down for some, like, no, no, you, you be you, you talk the way you want to talk. But thank you so much for drawing that card. I know it's not a full fledged tarot reading and I, I don't want to, I don't want to take a, a service from you that you, typically charge people for but i do appreciate you drawing that card for me it really spoke to me just now and i don't know if you can notice uh, people won't be able to see us doing this but you may notice i i I feel a little shook right now i don't don't know if you can see that on my face but it definitely resonates with me what you just told me so thank you for doing that you're welcome i hope that it resonates with the listeners too yeah it, it is that moment or that time of the year where we're getting to that that darkness again and we have to sort of clear out our basements so to speak and that way when when spring comes we're all happy and fun again it's not a uh enjoyable process here but i do hope uh like you that it does resonate with people so sarah McAllister, please do give our listeners the deets if you will on where to find you and keep up with you uh so you can find me on instagram at spirit.cell if you're into the insta thing or uh, my website is spiritcelltarot.com. Awesome. Well, Sarah, again, thank you so much. Enjoy this immensely. We will do it again. Yeah. See you All later. Right. Have a good night. Bye-bye. 
And there you have it. My thanks again to Sarah McAllister. Check out her Spirit Cell website and give a follow to her Spirit Cell account on Instagram as well. Both are linked in the show notes. I really enjoyed this chat, especially once we got it going. I think there's something to the dots we connected with Pisces and Aquarius and Jesus and the fish and water symbolism. That may have low-key been my favorite part of the chat. And tarot itself is such a fascinating subject and discipline to me, one that I plan to explore a bit more with a couple upcoming guests. And the thing that got me the most at the end there was that Hanged Man card. You could probably tell how impactful it was to me in the moment, and when I listened back to it, I got that same sort of feeling again. That really was a spot-on card then, and it's still relevant now. An appropriate card considering the recent calendar flip too because this is one of those arbitrary time frames when people decide to make changes in their lives. So I'm sure that Sarah's explanation of the card did resonate with some of you, or at least I hope it did. It's not necessarily letting go and moving on, but letting go and making room. And you really don't need a certain day to do that. Just do it and see where life takes you. And remember that whatever direction you find yourself going in, you'll always end up right where you belong. The universe, your universe, is always working its magic in your favor. So, I don't know, maybe just let it. Hey, guess what? We are finally, finally on Patreon. Launched it officially at the beginning of the year here. I will not bore you with all the details, but there are four levels of support with different rewards at each level, including bonus episodes for patrons, opportunities to co-host shows with me, and chances to win free shit. And who doesn't like free shit? So if you're interested, click on through to patreon.com slash occulture. It's also linked in the show notes. If you're a current monthly supporter, I'm in the process of crafting a way for you guys to receive the same content. Of course, you could always cancel your payments through PayPal and switch to Patreon, no problem. But if that's too much of a hassle, just leave things as is and I'll hook you up. Hey, we also added a couple more cryptocurrencies to our list of one-time donation options. In addition to Bitcoin, we've added Ethereum and Ripple. I've been dabbling in both for a couple months now and didn't really want to make those wallets public, but hey, you know, as crypto continues to grow, why the hell not? We do have an interesting Bitcoin-centric episode coming up in a couple weeks too, so be on the lookout for that. Sort of an esoteric and conspiratorial look at it. It's a good one, I think. We've also received a few more reviews on iTunes, up to 31 now. 35 star reviews and one 3 star review. Hey, I've never claimed to be anything but an average dude, but I guess I'll have to work a bit harder for an improved review from whoever left 3 stars. Doesn't bother me, but I would have loved to have heard why. Why 3 stars? Why not 2? Why not 4? Why not leave some words and let me know why you think this is just average? Where's the constructive criticism? That's extremely beneficial to guys like me who are just trying to improve whenever and wherever they can. Regardless, I've got two copies of Gil Bates' Love in the Three Levels of Consciousness to give away to a couple five-star reviewers. First up is Tom in OK, which I assume stands for Oklahoma, but I could be wrong. But Tom writes a headline that says, I came for the conspiracy talk. And then in the body of the review says, Stayed for the in-depth, heartfelt exploration of the huge variety of different aspects of what it means to be alive. I gotta say, Tom, that's kind of what I'm going for. Yeah. I have a lot of different curiosities about what it means to be human, and I try to use this podcast as an avenue to explore just that. So thanks for the review. The second review comes from Socially Unacceptable. And this was cool because the name is upside down somehow. Kudos on figuring that out in iTunes there. But the headline from Socially Unacceptable is Podcasting Excellence. And the review says this, I'm very particular about the podcast that I invest precious time listening to. I value hosts who thoroughly familiarize themselves with their guests' work, prepare for their interviews, and don't go off on long tangents or pose awkwardly off-topic questions that are outside of their guests' expertise. This production incorporates all of that and more. I appreciate the effort towards sound quality and editing, and the host's voice is pleasing and down-to-earth. Well, thank you. The guest lineup is particularly impressive, and the discussions are deeply thought-provoking, often inducing a desire to research further and learn more. All around, a very well-done show that keeps me looking forward to the next episode, one of the best in its class. Thank you for that review. I do introduce these topics in a certain manner with the intent that you guys as listeners 
hopefully have your curiosity peaked and go off and do your own research because that, as I've said before, is the best way to learn. So my thanks again to Tom and Socially Unacceptable for the reviews. If you guys could send me an email to oculture at protonmail.com, that's oculture at protonmail.com, I will get those books in the mail to you as soon as possible. I do like these review giveaways. I wish I would have done this sooner, and we'll definitely do some more of these in the future for sure. And the last bit of news here, I mentioned in the last episode that the show is now on Spotify and it's fully populated in their database, so my thanks to anyone checking us out on there. I also submitted the show to the iHeartRadio app just before I hit record here actually, so it's probably not there yet, but it should be in the next few days. Just a couple more listening options and an opportunity to hopefully reach some new listeners. Although, because I am trying to grow the show and putting it out through these new channels, I am looking at some new options for theme music. The current theme is awesome, but I'm not sure where remixes fall in terms of copyright. I really don't want to change the music because it sets such an awesome tone for the show. So we'll see, I guess. I mean, I've done 60 episodes now with it, so why change, right? Although, if anyone knows someone who makes music, preferably in the EDM or hip-hop genres, please drop me a line. I do have an emergency backup theme that's more of a rock cover version of the same song I currently use. I actually used it as the theme song of my previous podcast, and I may bring that back because I do have permission from the band who recorded it to use it, and it is a cover version, which I think is easier to get away with, and I also quite like it. Actually, you know what? Let's go ahead and play it. Let's use that to end the show here. Tell me what you guys think of it. The song is Giorgio Moroder's Chase, covered by a band called Kings Love Jacks. And I am a cover of the man called Ryan Peverly, who's reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Because they're pigs. You're a pig!